Today, I want to teach about something that I don't believe will end today. Hopefully, I will teach uh, another space of it on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, but what I'm going to preach tonight suffices for tonight's understanding. And I pray that may God give you a liberty and a grace to understand the things that are going to be spoken tonight because they're going to change you. They're going to change you for good. In Colossians, the first chapter, the ninth verse, a wonderful uh, prayer there is given by the apostolic voices of that hour. And they say, for this cause we also, since the day we heard, uh, of course, of your love in the spirit, if you've read the verses before, we do not cease to pray for you. Okay, this is a continuous prayer. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. If you have followed this ministry for some time, I have emphasized that always take note of the things that are constantly prayed for, or things that are constantly done in the faith. For if Paul believed and acted in that way, then there is a deliberate plan and purpose for our learning in this dispensation to align ourselves to such continuousness or to such continuity, okay? So the, 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 here he's saying they do not cease to pray for the church in Colossae. This is a continuous prayer. It's a prayer that is ceaseless. And that's a prayer I believe everybody should continue to pray for themselves or for their own, that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that they might be filled with the epignosis of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And when once, once, once that knowledge comes, once that wisdom, once that understanding comes, the Bible says that they might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing. Worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, that you, you walk worthy of the Lord and that you're pleasing unto all things. Okay? And he continues to say, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, what I want to emphasize tonight is being fruitful in every good work. Today, I want to teach about the secret of fruitfulness. I want to emphasize something about being fruitful for God. Producing fruit that remains to the glory of God. Christianity has to emphasize this in this hour more than ever before, that we are to produce fruit that remaineth. We are, we were called to be fruitful in every good work. Is it good to have an education? Yes. Then you are called to be fruitful in that education. Whether you're the one educated or that you're the one educating. Is it a good thing uh, to have a wonderful, successful, growing ministry? Yes. Then he says, then you have to be fruitful. If it's a good thing, then you have to be fruitful. If it's a good work, you have to be fruitful. Marriage is a good work. Raising children is a good work. Ministry is a good work. Careers are a good work. All of these things are a good work. Running a, good, a business is a good work. Any good work. He says, you must learn the secret of being fruitful. And tonight as I share, I will open your eyes by the grace of God to that mystery, to that secret. So it's, it's an open thing for you. So you position yourself in this period and hour. Well, many are casting down. I decree that you are going to have a rising up in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. When God created man, we know that he created man on the sixth day. And then he put that man in the garden. And in Genesis chapter 1 verses 28, the Bible says, when he created man, put him in the garden, the Bible says he blessed them and he said unto them, be fruitful. That was the first command. Be fruitful. 
That was the first blessing. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So do it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. But what was the first thing he did? He blessed them saying, be fruitful. That was the first commanded blessing on humanity. To be fruitful. So first, and those of you who are readers of the Bible, you know what the law first mentioned means. Why is it that in the order of the things blessed on man in the garden, it is fruitfulness that comes first? Because it's a very integral part of the divine nature to bestow fruit to his creation. He has called us to a life of fruitfulness. It's a commanded blessing working on all humanity to be fruitful, especially to the household of faith. And I emphasize that. And so we see when Adam receives this command, when he receives that responsibility, it is the sealed instruction that he passes on to his own children. And we see generations upon generations emphasizing the power of fruitfulness in the commanded blessing. We see it in the days of Noah. Remember the time when the world was wicked? And every man went their own way. The fallen angelics had been one with the children of men and produced a strange creation. And all wickedness was on the earth. And the story is given that God tells a man to build an ark. This is Noah. And then he gets his family in. You know the story. He gets all the animals in and then they're floating on this boat for a time. And the time comes and uh, they have to get down on the ground and do life again. And in Genesis chapter 9, the first verse, the first time Noah's family lands on the ground and they now need to reconstruct or rebuild human life as we know it because the rest of it had been flooded. The first thing God tells him, the Bible says God blessed Noah and his sons and he said unto them again, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But what was, was, what was the first command? Be fruitful. Be fruitful. It's a very integral part of his nature to bestow fruitfulness to the sons of men. Because that's God. That's how he sees you. That's what he plans for you. When the Bible says that I know the plans that I have for you, plans to make you prosper, not to harm you, to give you a future and hope that expected in. God is saying, I have sent a commanded blessing for you to be fruitful. What does it mean to be fruitful? To grow, to increase in the thing that you're doing, to expand in the vision that you carry with the equal manifestation of grace to sustain you and preserve you to the end as you grow. You see, many believers do not understand the power of preservation. The power of preservation. It's one thing to be able to do a wonderful meeting for one day, for two days, for three days. But it's another when that meeting continues for one year and it's preserved. Two years and it's preserved. Three years and it's preserved. Four years and it's preserved. Five years and it's preserved. Ten years and it's preserved. 20 years and it's preserved, 30 years and it's preserved. And you look at the individual and the path of the justice through the scripture says shines brighter and brighter. You see this individual growing and increasing every day, preserving what is already available and God is increasing as God adds on to it. For the pastor whose front door continuously is open for people to walk in, but the back door is closed enough that he has the grace to preserve and sustain the work of God. That is a great glory. And I wish I have time one day to teach about the power of preservation, the power that preserves things. You need to know how to keep this thing. You need to know how to guard the thing that is upon you. It's a marriage. You need to know how to preserve it. It's a business. You need to know how to preserve it. It's a, it's a ministry. You need to know how to preserve it. It's a career. You need to know how to preserve it. If it's a program or an institution or a project, you need to know how to preserve it. You need to know how. You need to understand the power of preservation. 
So anyway, with Noah, the first command is be fruitful. Because he knows they have to be fruitful. It's an important thing to God. All right? So yeah, we all call him uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But before that, all these patriarchs have a relationship with him. And all of them have received this wonderful promise. This wonderful promise. And so when we go into the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, if you read in Genesis chapter 17, when God has an encounter or when Abraham has an encounter with God and God wants to give a new covenant to this man, the Bible says in the fourth verse, God tells Abraham, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And he tells him, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And he tells him, and neither shall thy name be any more be called Abram. He says, but thy name shall be Abraham. And last Sunday, I told about the power uh, of blessing, the blessing that, that comes after the changing of a name. And I told you that the blessing cannot stand where there is no change of name if the name is of a fallen nature. So God, or oh, an inferior nature, fallen or inferior. So God elevates this man by naming and he tells him from today, you're not Abraham, but Abraham, okay? Meaning father of many. For he says, for a father of many have I made thee. And the next verse says, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. I will make you exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. So nations are made of thee. Kings are coming out of thee as a result of the exceeding fruitfulness. This is our father. So when Abraham becomes what the Lord has said he is, he has a son. We see the continuation of that glory in the life of Isaac. But even before we get into the life of Isaac, he gets to Ishmael the other boy he has with Hagar, the mistress or the, 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 the maid of Sarah. The, the, we see that, remember, for those of you who don't know the story, Abraham tells, uh, sorry, Sarah tells Abraham to go into the maid and then they have a son called Ishmael and the maid is called Hagar, okay? And, and God emphasizes it even in the 20th verse when Abraham is confused about you know, the, the destiny of his boy. God tells him, as for Ishmael, he says, I have had thee. Because he, he asks God, I pray that my son Ishmael, even though he's not of the promise, that he might live before thee. God tells him, as for Ishmael, I have had thee. Behold, I have blessed him. And I will make him fruitful. And I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. And I will make him a great nation. See, if you're a reader of the Bible, you will understand that Ishmael was not the child of the promise. He was a child of the maiden servant. But even with that, because he comes out of the loins of Abraham, God promises that even with Ishmael, he shall make fruitful. Again, how much more than the Isaac of the promise? So when we see Isaac later coming in, in Genesis 26, we see a famine. He goes to the household of Abimelech, the Philistines. He dwells there with the men of Gera. But the Bible tells us that even in a foreign land, Isaac was fruitful. He was fruitful. To a point where the Philistines tell him, you know what? Get out of, from among us because you have become more successful, exceedingly successful than we are in our own land. So they have a problem. You've become mightier than us. There's, there's a commanded blessing moving in every generation. And we see this man of God, Isaac, digging wells and the Philistines strive with them. They frustrate and then, you know, but everywhere he digs, the wells respond. Everywhere he digs, the wells respond. Everywhere he digs, the wells respond until they get to Rehoboth. And he says, with this we shall be successful. Even in the land that is not their own, 
The Bible tells us that he was a successful man. He was a fruitful man because there was something following him from generations before God had spoken on that lineage. Hallelujah, glory to God. And so we see him in old age. The Bible tells us in Genesis 28. Oh, if I can go earlier and give you a small background for those of you who don't know the story. We see two sons, Jacob and Esau, begotten of Isaac. And then Jacob steals the birthright of Esau and the blessing of Esau. And then we see him warned by his mother. Esau is uh, wroth, he's annoyed, his heart is going to kill you, flee to Laban. Uh, your uncle, and so he prepares to go. And we see Isaac calling Jacob on the side because Isaac has nothing to do. The blessing has been taken, you know. He has pronounced everything that has to be pronounced over him. He cannot reverse the words that were spoken over that boy. So he knows that much as he loves us, so Jacob is the blessed of the Lord. And so he summons him. In Genesis 28, the first verse, the Bible says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, uh, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence from the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, Comma, and make thee fruitful, comma, and multiply thee, that thou mayst be a multitude of people. You see, again, it comes with a fruitfulness that leads to multiplication and increase and growth and all these kinds of things. So God has intended that we be fruitful, that we be fruitful. When you get into the New Testament, Jesus has promised in John 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 7, he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, he says, you shall ask whatsoever ye will and it shall be done you. Whatsoever ye will and it shall be done you. If, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. And he says, herein is my Father glorified. This is the glory of the New Testament story or dispensation. That ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So every disciple of the Christ must bear fruit because that is the glorification of the Father in the face of Jesus Christ. You have no choice but to be fruitful, you must be fruitful. You have to be fruitful. So when Paul says in Colossians that he's praying for the church, that they might be filled with all the knowledge of his will, his understanding, his wisdom, his knowledge in this matter, that they might be filled with all this. He hopes that once you understand the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding concerning your life as a believer, you will walk worthy of the Lord as God expects you. And if you walk or when you walk as God expects you, the Bible says you shall be fruitful. You will be fruitful pleasing unto God and fruitful in every good work. So the catch for us here is understanding the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we might know and understand how God sees and relates with us in this mystery. Now, here is the mystery. Here is the secret. If you look at how God created man, allow me to go back in Genesis. If you see how God created man, when you see him tell man, you shall eat of every fruit in the garden, save the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, have you asked yourself, was there a season for these fruits 
Was there a season that these fruits underwent? So for us to assume that there was a season these fruits would grow and then ripen and then fall and then another season comes through and then, you know, the weather has to play its science and then we wait for another year uh, when these fruits would come through and again they reap what they have to reap and eat whatever they have to eat. No. What you see in the elements of the weather working with the world to give you fruit is because of the fallen state of man and the corruption that goes into the world because of the fallen nature of man. It was not so from the beginning. In other words, in the Garden of Eden, the fruits were available every year, every time. There was never a record in Eden that there was a time certain things were not available because it was not their season to grow. That is the provisional mind of God. That is, that is, that is the mind of God in provision. Let me say it that way. That, that's God's vision for you, touching provision. The fruits were available every year. Everything given to man to eat was available for his eating at the time and space man wanted to eat. There was no tilling of the ground. There was no space of waiting for water to come down and, you know, water the garden. No, the Bible says, in fact, that the garden was watered from, with water from, from below. God provided that water. Everything was sustained by the power of God for provision. That means before the fall of man, there was never a consciousness of luck submitted to the season or times of existence when Adam and Eve were in the garden. That is why when Jesus comes with that consciousness, one of those days he gets hungry and as he gets hungry, he sees a fig tree afar off and the Bible says he goes there to that tree hoping to have something to eat. Okay? And the Bible says he found no figs. Why? For it was not yet the time of figs. And the Bible says, and Jesus answered and said, and to eat no man shall eat here of thee. Uh, and his disciples had it. The next day, the Bible tells us if the, the, tree, the tree withered. Okay, now, mark this. Jesus walks to a tree. He is 100% God. And to assume that he's not conscious, that it's not the season, would be a wrong assumption of who God is. But if we agree that he was conscious, that it was not yet season for the fig to bring forth figs. Then he knew what he was doing by walking to eat because he carried no consciousness of him lacking some to eat because it was not the season of the tree to produce fruit. I hope you understood it. Now, Jesus carries the very mind of the Father God, the very mind with which the garden in Eden was made for man before his fallen nature. That everything that man needed for his sufficiency, his provision and satisfaction ought to be available in the time he needs it and it's not subject to any season. It is subject to the need of the man. Such liberty is so hard to express when you were born in a fallen world with corrupt elements with corrupt elements. So he says to man from today, you shall till from the ground of the, from the sweat of your brow, thou shalt feed or have meat. Then God changes the seasons. He creates seasons on the earth for the planting, for the reaping, for all of these kinds of things. But that was not so from the beginning. It was not so from the beginning. The responsibility of God in, in the garden was to make sure that Adam and Eve were provided for continuously. And that's the mind of God. I'm not talking about just a fruitfulness for a season. I'm not talking about a fruitfulness in a season. I'm talking about a continuous fruitfulness for the rest of your life. And it is possible and available for those who believe. So when Jesus comes with a God mind, 
And then he comes to this tree and he finds that it has no figs in the time when he is hungry because it will give the excuse of its timing and season. The Son of God has to curse it because he expects that as its maker, its creator, it ought to know better that the man who has walked to that tree is no average fellow. He's not of a fallen nature. He is born of God. He is the seed of God coming in the likeness of man, the form of a servant. But in there, that man is not fallen. He, he has not known any sin. He is holy. He is righteous. He is the word of God. He is the very word by which the world were framed. Even this tree was created. How can it deny him in the time when he's hungry? So the Lord Jesus curses him. Of course, if you're thinking logically, it's not a fair thing. If you want to reason this out, what did the tree do? I mean, God had made it that way. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. The tree was subject to that corruption because of the fallen nature of man. God had not made trees to be that way. Hallelujah. We see the grand picture, the sum of his vision in the garden, Eden. And that's where man falls. But I want you to see God's consciousness that he, when he says be fruitful, be fruitful. He has triggered a certain provision that should be available at every hour, at every time of your life, and thereby will compel you to justify the fruitfulness of your life. It is justified by the continuous provision that is available for all who believe and that man will be without excuse because all that should be known of him, even the Godhead has been revealed unto them. Now they are without excuse. They are without excuse. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world, they have all clearly, been clearly revealed through the express image of the invisible God, the person of Jesus Christ. He spoke in all through the prophets in diverse manners and ways at sundry times. But now the Bible says he has spoken through the person of Jesus Christ to understand the Christ, his ministry, his person, God's intention of sending him to study the word and know the things that are freely given unto you by God. Why he has to go to leave you the person of the Holy Spirit to be present with you as the guarantee and revealer of the things that have been freely given unto you by Christ. To see the fields white, to lift your head and see the fields white and ready. To even look at the people who are not yet born again as a harvest and not a seed. To have that revelation is a very, very great experience for the new birth. Because it means you, you, you understand why he says you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You understand why he has given you everything that pertains to life and goodness. You understand these things very clearly. They come so clearly to you. You become cautious of God's provision and the intended mind behind that provision to make sure that you reveal the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of God, the working of God in you, spiritually, in your soul, and physically in the things that are seen. He has given us the fruit of the Spirit, love, long-suffering, and all these kinds of things. And all of those are as a result of the blessed fruitfulness that we have received, more so for us which are born again in Christ. But not only the things we see spiritual, we are to be fruitful even in the physical realm. He has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing is all given. So, you are not to learn love. You are a lover because... You have the Holy Spirit and the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The long-suffering and all these things, they, they are in you. Not to enter them, but to walk in them because they've been given in you when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. 
Those things are in there. The fruits of the Spirit are in there. The fruits of your soul, man, are there. The fruits of your physical man in the physical realm, they are there. The peace of God, it's in you because the chastisement of your peace was upon him. So the peace of God is within you. The gentleness, the faith of God is in you. Why? Because you have the word Jesus Christ is in you. All these things are in you. That is why the communication of your faith is effectual as you acknowledge every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. If you don't have peace, say, Father, I thank you because I have peace. Even though I don't feel it, but it is there because it's given me by the Holy Spirit, by the person of Jesus who resides in me through faith. Okay? So the, the secret is for you to see God's mind in provision for your fruitfulness. That's why the mystery is. If Adam landed in a garden with all provision and God tells him, be fruitful, he's telling him, continue in this grace. That's what he's telling him. He's telling him, align yourself continually in the grace of my provision. That's what he's telling him. That's what he's telling him. Unfortunately, Adam fell. And he ate the forbidden fruit. And man fell. He was taken out of that provision. Of that glory. Of that consciousness. And then he was awakened to lack. And the first awakening to lack was his realization that he was naked. He didn't have clothes on him. That was because they were awakened. That's why God asks Adam and Eve, who told you you're naked? Have you eaten what you were supposed, not supposed to eat? Because they were, they were now fallen. The first consciousness of their luck was clothes. And since then, humanity has lived in a consciousness of lack once it is moving or functioning in the fallen nature. That's how it is. So Jesus does something. He goes on the cross. He's wounded for their transgressions. He's bruised for their iniquities, the chastisement of their peace is upon him. He's crucified and he dies. And as God would have it, in unwinding this to restore man back to life. Because in the space where God has given life and fruitfulness and continuous fruit in a continuous season of provision, man brings death and is disqualified from that realm and space. So when Jesus dies, again, the Bible is very clear. He's crucified and dies on the sixth day like man was blessed in the garden on the sixth day created on the sixth day on the sixth day Jesus Christ is taken from the cross in John chapter 19 verses 41 and the Bible says now in the place where he was crucified the Bible says there was a garden follow me there was a garden and in the garden, the Bible says, a new sepulcher, wherein never was a man laid. And they laid Jesus there because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Whoa. The first man begins his journey in the garden, space of fruitfulness, provision continuously. Fruit, the fruit physical was available to him all year round, every day, 365 days a year, continuously provided by God. And then in that provision, man goes against the order of God and brings death in the space where God had put life. So God sends Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ is crucified on the cross and dies, he gives up the ghost. His body is taken in a garden. And as his body is taken in a garden, he's buried in a sepulcher no man has been. God is trying to tell us that if the first man brought death within a garden of provision, the second Adam is going to come and die in the place. Also in a typification, 
a sort of garden because therein he wants to bring life and create a certain newness of consciousness in the resurrection. And so when Jesus goes into that garden, when they're putting, they, they, they just think they're putting this man in the garden. He could have been put in any sepulcher. Jesus could have been buried anywhere. Hope this guy's getting his body and throwing it somewhere in, in, in the desert. But no, God had a picture. He said, no, it began in a garden. And if man fell and brought death there, that death in the garden stayed there. The, 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 the sting of death stayed in that garden. I need to create a typification of story again through this second Adam because Jesus is called the second Adam in Corinthians to come back as well and let his uh, body of death be put in a sort of a garden because with there life shall be given in the space where death took place in the first Adamic order. Now when Jesus is raised from the dead into glory, he looks at everyone who should believe him as one that must produce fruit. In fact, he is tough. He says, you shall know them by their fruit. You shall know my disciples by their fruit. And that fruit which they produce, that remaineth. Although many people use that scripture only to judge those who are of God and those who are not. Yes, it's true that the principle of fruitfulness defines the judgments of God in the realms with which we dwell individually. And that's the truth. But let us understand this from the perspective of, we have understood that the bad tree produces bad fruit. Well, I am the good fruit. I'm the planting of the Lord. I'm watered and nourished, flourishing, fattening by God. And so I'm this side of it. In fact, it says, and the tree which produces not fruit, the Bible says it's cut, it's cast away. It is burned if it has to, because it has no choice but to produce a certain kind. So it's your nature to be fruitful if you're a new creation. The fruit of the Spirit, working in you, to be gentle, to be peaceable, to be long-suffering, to be loving. Fruit of your soul, to have a godly temperament. Your character, your emotions are in check. Your outward ministration, the physical realm. That is why you can't understand this and be without fruit. In fact, the Bible says, if you know these things, when these things come to your revelation, they make you to neither be barren nor unfruitful. You, you have to be fruitful. You, you have to bring forth because this revelation has come to your spirit. This understanding has come to your spirit. So when you become born again, you are again redirected as the man which was in the garden. Only difference is that that one was a living soul. You are redirected in your sort of realm of garden as a child of God with an awakened spirit. Because the first Adam was a living soul. The second one was a life-giving. So when you are awakened in this life of the new creation, you're not just awakened to life. I'm come that you may have life. But you come also as one which awakens to life as a life-giver. Jesus says, I'm come that you might have life and life to the fullest. But you see, but he that has the son, the Bible says, has life. So different from you and the first Adamic, the first Adamic is in a garden, but without a certain life, without a certain knowledge. And that life now is in you, the believer. But also with an awakened consciousness to the things and the elements of this world to be able to respond to you as a child of God. So when Jesus sees your potential, he says, with this thing, you shall speak to a mountain until it be thou removed from yonder place and be thrown in the sea. And the Bible says, and that mountain will be moved by faith. Now, if you can move a mountain, can't you control elements? If the fallen Adamic walked to a tree to get a fruit and there was no fruit, he would say, ah, it's not the season. And it would walk away to look for an alternative, for a plan B, for the other thing, if this has failed. The new creation of whose all 
things are of God. When it walks to this fig tree and there's no fruit, it has to carry the boldness to either curse it or the tree carries the consciousness that when this kind of light walks to me, it's not about the season. It's not about my season. It's not about the corrupt elements of the earth that was put in subjection to bondage against itself. It is my responsibility to make sure that when he turns, when she turns to me, I must be able to give him fruit because he's hungry. If you understand that, then you have understood the glory of divine provision that propels you, that stirs you to the true fruitfulness of God. I know that some of you will need to listen to this sermon twice or thrice to understand it because there's a lot to contemplate, to meditate, to think through. But it doesn't matter how many times you listen to it. Listen to this thing until you can understand it. Everything you're walking to sees you a certain way. The ground you're walking sees you a certain way. The trees that you're passing or driving uh, away from that, or, 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 or toward, they, they see you a certain way. The animals of this world, they see you a certain way. Everything sees you a certain way. But sometimes it gets shocked that you're not to that consciousness. And then the devil multiplies deception with the things that he, he sees you do not know. And then you start to live as a fallen man, yet you are glorified by God by reason of the Christ in the inside of you. That is why Christians are poor. That is why Christians lack. That is why Christians struggle. That is why Christians strive. That is why Christians are slow. That is why Christians have failed to break through to certain spaces spiritually, in the soul and in the body. Understand what God has done through Christ. Understand what he has done through Christ. When you understand what he has done, embrace whatever is given and Stir the consciousness of who you are in God and how these things really see you. Not ought to see you because it doesn't change how they see you, but sometimes they cannot respond because they don't hear you command them the way you should command them spiritually. Because commanding is more than the words we speak. It's the authority from which we speak. That is why you can get a devil in somebody and somebody casts out devils for hours and he doesn't go. And then another man comes, looks at the same devils and tells it go, and then he goes. They've all spoken the same word. But one is speaking with head knowledge and unbelief and indifference and a certain ignorance. And another is speaking from the authority of the Spirit that only comes through the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul prays for church. And he says, that you made walk worthy of the Lord and to all, uh, all, all pleasing. And he says, being fruitful in every good work. Every good work. That means everything you're doing, you will have fruit. You will be fruitful in everything. If you are a leader, you will be fruitful. If you're a pastor, you will be fruitful. In your marriage, you will be fruitful. In raising children, you will be fruitful. And fruit that remaineth, that is preserved. Fruit that remaineth, and I must emphasize that. You don't have just this one thing up and then tomorrow you're done. No, no, no. You have fruit that remaineth and to the glory of God. That's where God has called you to be. That's what He has called you to do. Now you have the choice. You've understood it. That's the mystery. That's the mystery. Like the first Adam entered that garden, all provision available. The second Adam, Christ, has earned for us to enter a life where everything has been provided. We've been given. All things are yours and all are Christ's. And Christ is God. So, awaken yourself to that consciousness. Speak, pray that way. When you get to a point and you don't have rent, thank God. Tell him, God, there is no way I can lack. I thank you because my rent is coming. It's going to be paid. It has to be paid. I cannot be without fruit. I thank you, oh God, because my ministry is growing. It's a success. It has to be a success because I was called to produce fruit. I am a fruit 
bearer. I bear fruit. He's the vine, I'm the branch. There is no way results cannot come out of me. When you get that consciousness in your spirit and apply it to every aspect of your life, the Bible says your profiting will appear unto all. Everybody will be able to see that there is something about this man, there is something about this woman that is progressing every day. And they will want to learn. How do you do it? How? It's not by power, not by might, but by His Spirit. Saith the Lord. So I want to pray with you as I finish this broadcast. I feel a stirring in my spirit that even though in this time a lot is happening, oh, you know, COVID season, oh, you know, businesses are not moving as they should, oh, you know, you know, schools are closed, oh, you know, my uh, careers are on hold, oh, you know, uh, commitments cannot move as they should, oh, you know, so churches are closed in some spaces and locked down everywhere, oh, you know, yeah, you can speak all that. But we are conscious of our fruitfulness. In COVID season as a ministry, we have seen growth in this season than we're even growing while we're congregating individually. Why? Because COVID or no COVID, I'm a bearer of fruit and it shall remain. Some of you Christians listening to me recently, I was sitting with a bunch of Christians, says, but Papa, we've made more money in this period than we have ever. And I told them, because you have to be fruitful in and out of season, the seasons of the world that is, because your season is your realm of faith. And that is how it shall be. And I'm excited for after COVID because it's going to go up and up. God has not left us. He's still with us. Yes, places of worship are closed, but the gospel is not in chains. The church is still moving. The views are increasing every day on YouTube, on Facebook, on all the platforms. More people are listening to me now than they were in the past on Lighthouse Television, on Spirit TV. I mean, people are watching across the world to the glory of God because we produce fruit in every season because we arrest seasons in our realms of faith to provide for what we believe. That is your story. Now I want you to raise your voice and thank God for the word you've received. Just thank God for the word you received. Tell him, Father, I thank you for this hour. Tell him, I thank you for this time. Tell him, I thank you for this year. Tell him, I thank you for this month. Tell him, I thank you for this day. Tell him, I thank you because you've revealed to me the power of fruitfulness. And I am fruitful. I am fruitful. I am fruitful. I am fruitful. I see the secret of fruitfulness so clearly. My mind is filled with fruit. My spirit is aligned to fruit. My body and my soul agree with the glory of fruitfulness. I am fruitful going in and fruitful going out. I am fruitful in my own country and fruitful out of my country. I am fruitful in my land. I am fruitful in foreign lands. I am fruitful in media. I am fruitful everywhere. I'm fruitful in everything that I do. Glory to God. My family is fruitful. My children are fruitful. My projects are fruitful. My businesses are fruitful. My career is fruitful. I see that the fields are white and they are ready. I see that all provision that I've been needed is here and available. I see that I've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. I see that the world is mine. I see that the things of this world bow to my command, to the glory of God. I see that I'm the head and not the tail. I see that I'm above and not beneath. I see that I go forward. I go upward. I increase in every aspect. I grow on every side. I expand in every sphere. I reconcile all chasm. I walk through troops. I vault high fences. I change this world.
called Mata Brozolo Boko Shikatalapa. And I have the life of God in me to give life to the things that are dead, to give life to the things that are not moving, to give life to the things that are stalled. I decree and I declare that everywhere that I go, everybody that I touch, everybody that I pray for, everybody that I speak to receives this thing, receives this life, receives this compelling power. In the mighty name of Jesus, I cannot fail. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and believed. Hallelujah. If you're sick in your body, you heal. You heal. Your businesses heal. Your careers heal. Your relationships heal. Matele koza lapa. But above all, your body is going to be productive in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive it and say amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you a grand opportunity. But the Bible says there's no name in heaven or under earth or in earth by which men are saved except the name of Jesus Christ. And the sound of that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses of the things in the earth, under earth and in heaven. And every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He's the same Jesus that gave his life for you, that gave that transaction uh, for you that you might have life and have it more abundantly until it overflows. Receive him tonight as your personal Lord and Savior. If you want to do that, you just repeat this words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. I'm born again. Amen. Welcome to a fruitful life. Welcome to a life of glory. Welcome to a life of joy. Welcome to a life of peace. Welcome to a life eternal and that is yours given freely by Christ. So if you have made that prayer, I want you to go on funero.org slash salvation on our website. I want to check your email, your details. I want to share with you and help you understand what it means to walk this walk of salvation since you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And those of you who have testimonies, kindly go on funero.org slash testimonies. Uh, and, and, and send your testimony in. I'll, I'll be reading them as I read these. And I believe something has happened this evening. Kings shall come to my rising. Because I am favored and graced. And all I do, I shall prosper. Everything I touch shall be blessed. Oh, be quiet. by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Venero, make manifest.